Hello, and thank you for joining this MD Magazine peer exchange titled, Identifying the Biomarkers for the Treatment of Severe Asthma. We now have a better understanding of the type 2 asthma pathway, including allergic and eosinophilic asthma, which are the causes of most asthma. In the last two decades, there's been a dramatic growth in the biologics market for the treatment of asthma. This highly selective treatment approach focuses on different inflammatory pathways and blocking those pathways. We'll dive into a closer look at the different biologics approved in the United States and their mechanisms of action. We'll also gain a better understanding of identifying biomarkers that might aid in phenotyping to help individualize treatment for these patients. I'm Dr. Neil Jane. I'm the Director of Research at Arizona Allergy and Immunology Research. I'm also the co-owner of Arcadia Allergy and Asthma and Santan Allergy and Asthma in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm a practicing allergist and immunologist clinician with an interest in severe asthma and biomarkers for the evaluation of asthma. Participating today on our panel are Dr. Nicola Hanania, Associate Professor of Medicine and Pulmonary Medicine Department at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. He's also the Director of the Airways Clinical Research Center at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and Director of the Asthma and COPD Clinic at Ben Taub Hospital in Houston, Texas. We also have Dr. Bradley Chips, former President of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, um, and he is in practice in Sacramento, California. Lastly, we have Dr. Aidan Long, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Thank you for joining us, and let's begin. So to start off this discussion, I think it's important to sort of take a step back and, and think about asthma and, and from a more basic standpoint before we get into sort of a discussion about biologics and, and biomarkers. Um, and so I thought it might be helpful to just sort of start off and think a little bit about what happens pathophysiologically when we think about asthma. Aidan, you want to lead us off? Yeah, so, so asthma is a disease of airway obstruction. The airways uh, that carry the air from outside to the alveoli get uh, constricted, a combination of muscle spasm, and predominantly these days we realize it's a disease of inflammation. So there's inflammatory cells getting in there, there's swelling, there's mucus production. So it's a combination of three things, smooth muscle contraction, swelling, and increased mucus production. Together, these things cause obstruction to the airways. The patient experiences difficulty moving air in and out, more moving out than in. When we breathe in, we have extra muscles that help us. When we breathe out, we just relax. So there's nothing to help us breathing out. So it's a dis disorder of moving air in and out, feels uncomfortable, chest tightness, wheezing, shortness of breath. Sure, sure. And so I think, th you know, building upon that, um, you know, we've learned a lot about the pathophysiology, obviously, in the last few decades. Um, and we've started to begin to think about asthma, um, sort of what's old is new. Um, but we started to think about asthma again in terms of different types of inflammation. Um, and so, Brad, you know, just sort of curious, you know, we are hearing more and more about this idea of type 2 inflammation. And I, I was wondering if you could share some thoughts on what that means as far as type 2 high versus type 2 low and how you think about that? Well, as we think about how airway inflammation is modified by either biologic or steroid, we think about type 2 asthma as being the poster child for that, driven by Th2 lymphocytes or, or IOC2 cells, all driving increased eosinophil activity, which is a marker of disease activity or a disease that is potentially helpful with steroid treatment or with a, one of the currently approved biologics. The flip side of that, of course, being low T2 asthma, which is primarily, at least in part, neutrophil driven, which tends to be more refractory to therapy and is a bigger challenge for all of us. Now, whether T2 asthma is 50%, 60%, whether it stays persistent over time, that's all there's literature on both sides of that fence, and so I think we have to blend all those things together as we try to identify the patient who will respond by decreasing exacerbations, which are the reason that all the currently available biologics were approved, and that is a big challenge we have now. That's why we all have a job. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I, I was struck by um, a study from a long time ago. Uh, Sir Francis Rackman, who was the head of allergy at Mass General, the first allergy clinic in the United States. And in the 1920s, he published a paper saying, I think there's two types of asthma. There's extrinsic asthma and intrinsic asthma. And the extrinsic he was referring to was allergic asthma, where 
outside triggers are driving it. I think it's curious these days, we have a similar dichotomy. We call it T2 high, which very largely seems to overlap, not completely, with allergic asthma, and then the intrinsic, which we're calling T2 low. So I think it's intriguing, we've come, mm -hmm. how far have we come? Right, right. Or and, have we come? And the role of infection, you know, as we, people used to use combined bacterial vaccine to treat asthma and try to downregulate infection, and now we're gaining more information that infectious processes may be a major factor in driving asthma. Yeah, microbiome, how that plays a role, all of these kinds of things. And so